Welcome to the Appliance Analyst Podcast. Today we're talking about everything to do with microwaves, from the most common issues you can have to the different brand recommendations and going through all sorts of troubleshooting issues that you might have with your microwave. I'm Craig. I run uh, ApplianceAnalyst.com. We cover everything to do with microwaves and lots of other appliances. Uh, and today I'm fortunate enough to be joined by James. James is an appliance repair expert with over 16 years of experience and he's repaired thousands and thousands of appliances, so including plenty of microwaves, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And always a pleasure to be here, man. Always good talking with you. Glad to have you on and uh, we can dive right in. What's the uh, the most common issue that you get a call for when it comes to microwaves? The most common issue is not heating. There are times when a microwave can start to not heat as well over time, but definitely the most common. When it comes to microwave, they're pretty simple in the sense that there's not a lot that makes up a microwave. And typically, if it's not heating, most often it's what we call kind of the high voltage circuit which are your magnetron which is what's essential for heating the food it actually creates kind of the microwave field that causes it not to heat which how a microwave actually heats is really interesting um i actually worked on microwaves for a few years before i thought one day like i know how to fix these but i don't even know how it heats up the food yeah. is it radiation mm -hmm. you know what is it so it's usually the microwave the capacitor and the diode it is possible depending on the microwave to do the repair yourself but just kind of depending on the circumstance and the price and everything, uh, it, it may not be the best option. And there's definitely a safety concern too uh, when it comes to that. So we could definitely get a little bit more detailed into that. Yeah, I think that would be a great place to start actually is um, for safety concerns if anyone's looking a bit repairing their own microwave. If we mention something that you know you can go and check yourself what would the sort of the uh, the disclaimers or the cautionary advice what is recommended to work on in, in terms of your own microwave and what's a sort of a no-go zone because we we are dealing with some pretty intense electricity here yeah definitely you know certain things if you're checking physical parts of it how well the door opens and closes the lights come on does it spin when this or that happens that's fine to leave it plugged in but as soon as you're going to start taking some screws off and you're going to expose anything on the inside 100% have it unplugged. In most appliance, like big appliance repair companies, they actually require a microwave safety course to be taken before they allow technicians to work on them. A lot of that comes from, so one of the components in a microwave is a capacitor. And the purpose of the capacitor is to basically smooth out the electricity that's flowing through it. And so when it does that, it actually holds electricity. And so microwaves back in the day, there was no safety device built into the capacitor. So if you were using it and then you just happen to work on it, you take the capacitor out, it could literally kill you at the time because there's enough stored in there to make that happen. Yeah. They have since made those capacitors with a built-in safety. It's basically kind of a um, resistor that will help to diffuse the voltage. Now, any technician is still gonna ground it out for safety. Um, but yeah, when you start getting into that, you definitely wanna kinda look online, look if it's something you're comfortable with. I would recommend most of the time if, if it has to do anything with a high voltage or you're thinking about changing the capacitor and the mag and the diode, I would probably recommend someone do it, a professional who has had the safety training. And if you're gonna do it, just be extremely careful. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And um, do you know if, like, how long ago the capacitor change was? You know, if there's anyone out there with a microwave that's, like, you know, old, old. How, how old do you think we're talking roughly, or is it? Uh, um, I, I know that for sure microwaves, since I started working on them, um, had that built in safety feature. So I would say if it's about 15 years or newer, um, it probably has it. There's actually a picture on the capacitor that shows kind of a square and then kind of like a jagged line, almost like a pulse on a thing at a hospital. So that tells you it does have that built-in safety. One way to be really, really safe is if you know how to ground something out to do that, which basically would consist of a long screwdriver and a jumper that you would connect on the metal of the screwdriver and then on the metal of the frame and then touch both ends of the capacitor. So any built up charge is gonna travel through that to the frame. You know, again, just have the experience to do so because if any of that's not right, instead of going to the frame, it's gonna go in you, which, you know, again, we're back to that not so safe. In general, if there's wood grain pattern on your microwave, it's probably old enough it doesn't have a built-in safety, you know, that kind of old school style. <laughs> yeah, so. good to know, if, you know, and if you have like, I don't know, a digital screen, you're probably okay. Yeah, yeah, um, in general, yeah. 
Yeah, but uh, I guess it sounds like or you can picture it similar to when you're jump starting a car or something and you put the the cable onto the the, the chassis of or the chassis of the car. Yeah, uh, yeah. To ground it like that. Yeah, it makes sense. Any tips that we're giving if you're not fully confident, just please call someone to help you out. If someone's microwave is producing sparks in mm-hmm. any sort of manner when they're turning it on or you know if it's cooking certain things it might spark a little is that a common call out for you and what would you look at you know is it fixable for the average person you know what's funny about that issue is when you see it happen I'm, it looks like your microwave's about to explode it seems like yeah. some really big extreme problem what's actually happening and this most often occurs in microwaves that have the plastic clips on the inside that allows a rack to be in there so what happens is overuse and over time and grease buildup and heat is where those plastic pieces pieces are touching the cavity of the microwave, it'll actually start to wear out some of the paint will start to come off. And so the energy that's inside the microwave, instead of just heating your food, it's basically finding a ground in the frame of the microwave. And so that's what you're seeing is it's sparking. What's really neat about that repair, so if you see it coming from inside the microwave, you investigate, you can see that it's kind of burnt and crispy, the metal's a little exposed. They actually make a microwave appliance paint that you could order off eBay or Amazon for five to ten dollars and it almost looks like a nail polish it's got a little brush and you basically clean the area real good with alcohol degreaser just get it nice and clean and then put a a coat or two on that spot a lot of times that'll fix it then that electricity can't find a ground it's covered up and it's good to go it's always amazing when you know you have something which is seems really technical and you know and maybe even dangerous but one small product and nothing technical can um, can actually solve it. If someone's had a sparking issue, maybe they've managed to solve it, but there's a sort of burning smell that's remained. Perhaps that's, you know, on some food when they cook it, but generally it could be more like, seems like it's coming from the metal or something like that. What would you, you look at there? For a burning smell, if it doesn't smell like something's literally about to catch on fire, but it's just kind of a faint odor, there's a lot of really cool ways to not only clean your microwave, but to deodorize it. And you'll find a ton of different methods on line from heating up a, a bowl of water with you know certain essential oils in it to baking soda to mm-hmm. they make a lot of products that'll steam your microwave when you're heating it up so it's really easy to clean so I, I think the best way would be to kind of look at that and, and see what you know you think is best but yeah, there's definitely a lot of ways most of which involves you know boiling something with a you know something in there to help deodorize it yeah got you and I imagine that would go you know that uh, that applies both for a burning smell maybe on the metal somewhere but also from you know if you've i don't know cooked some fish in there and it's splattered somewhere or something like that and it's just smelling oh yeah bad. yeah because the thing about a microwave when you shut the door it's pretty insulated so yeah if you're leaving the door shut all the time and you cooked fish in there a few days ago it'll still be waiting for you so yeah that's <laughs> not a bad yeah. idea yeah yeah good way to do it and i'm sure a good scrub down especially if it's a funky smell afterwards oh yeah um, yeah you know on the smell bit you know, because I, I know we'll get into it here in a little while, but there's a few different types of microwave from $50 microwave from Walmart that sits on a countertop to the ones that are built over the range to the ones that are built into the wall to the drawer type microwaves. In particular, the microwaves that are built over the range, uh, they have the vent exhaust feature, which is great for when you're cooking. But the thing about it is there are different filters on there that if you've had the same microwave for years and years and years and especially if you fry a lot of food and and you cook a lot of things with really strong smells and you use the vent every time you cook, that smell is going to build up in those filters and inside the microwave. So that's kind of another set of things to look at and check. And there's certain steps to cleaning those and all that. And those can even get enough grease buildup in them sometimes to where they'll... um, I, I actually had a call and the complaint was that the microwave was leaking. And at first I, I said, well, maybe they meant to make it on their dishwasher. You know, I didn't know what was going on. So I called the customer and they said, yeah, whenever we cook on our oven, our microwave leaks. And I, okay, well, I just got to see it. I have no idea what, what could be causing this. So what it ended up being was they probably fried foods at least once every day or two. And every time they did, they would have the exhaust going. They did that for years. There was so much grease build up on the inside when the oven underneath heated up, it would literally just start dripping oh, all that grease. So, oh, yeah. yeah, just certain things to kind of be careful for and how you use it. Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah. Just some extra flavoring in the dishes there. Oh, um, goodness, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for anyone with an over-the-range uh, microwave, is that something to be particularly aware of in terms of you're essentially 
is it could you consider it as your range is two like one filter covering two appliances or covering your cook- cooktop and your microwave which might need uh, changed or cleaned more regularly yeah exactly and a lot of times you'll find the instructions in the owner's manual and if you can't if you didn't come with one or you just moved in and you know you don't find it anywhere in the house you can always of course look online at the owner's manual but all over the range microwaves underneath always has one or two filters and they're kind of like a metal mesh filter and that's really the first line of defense as it's venting from the cooktop and those will generally as you push it either forward or or back away from you maybe about half an inch they just fall out you could soak those in a degreaser you could clean them in hot soapy water and let them dry those are pretty simple the one that's a little harder to get to that most people don't even really know it exists is there is actually a filter behind the vent. When you look at the microwave, you know, as if you were to open the door, right above it you'll see a, a plastic vent going all the way across. On top, there are typically two to four screws that hold that vent in place, and it will either slide to the left or right about a half an inch and come off, or it'll pop right off. That should be in your owner's manual because there is another filter behind that. And most microwaves, the only way you can access that filter is to remove that cover. Right, yeah, and you're getting a little a little bit more intense work in mm-hmm. terms of uh, removing that. And how, how often would you recommend someone does both filters, I guess, you know, one or the other? If you only use your the vent exhaust feature on it, maybe a few times a month and not really that often, you could probably get away with cleaning it once every six months to a year. But I mean, if you're cooking every day and you're frying a few times a week, you'll probably want to do it once a month because once those filters get full, especially with grease, it's going to take the path of least resistance. So it's going to start going anywhere else in your microwave it can. When it gets to the point, if it ever does start leaking, uh, it's essentially time for a new microwave because it's covered all of the electronics inside. Wow, yeah. And it's it's definitely a lot trickier to replace an over-the-range than a countertop. That is for sure. most of <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for sure. But yeah, it's I guess it's one of these things, especially if you've ha- used countertop microwaves your whole life and then you ch- you move into a home that's got an over-the-range, you maybe don't know these things. And yeah, it's yeah. Really great to know. Any sort of similar things to know with a wall microwave? What's nice about a wall microwave, you know, a lot of times they'll even be advertised that they're a little more expensive, but all a wall microwave is, is a countertop microwave in the wall with a trim kit around it. And so what's really convenient about those is a lot of times you can just get a regular countertop microwave if you need to replace one and put it in there you know, using the existing trim kit. But essentially, as far as how those operate, you know, the power rating on those, um, everything is just like a countertop microwave. Nice one. Okay. So I guess, yeah, could potentially save hundreds of dollars if you do, if you are thinking about a new one, just put the countertop in there and I'm assuming you can just buy a trim kit separately. Yeah. And that's a really good point. You know, you could even look at models of microwave that have an optional trim kit to purchase. You know, because right. then it's going to be specifically for it. So everything's going to look nice and tidy and there won't be any gaps or anything. I guess it, it goes back to the sort of general thing with a lot of appliances, you know, depending or, you know, it could be different brands, could be different models, makes they all kind of boil back to the same essential components that are just wrapped in a different casing. Yeah, so yeah definitely worth noting. The built-in kind of wall microwaves, it just made me think of the oven microwave combos. Those are, they look really nice and they look really fancy. They're usually also really expensive. The convenience is there. You've got the oven here, you've got the microwave here, and most of the time they share just one user interface control. And so they're really convenient. The only bad part is, let's say the unit's over $2,000. And the issue that you're having is that the microwave, say it stopped heating. You get an estimate, tech comes out and says, hey, it's $700. If you just had a regular oven and a countertop microwave, it wouldn't be $700. It would be buy a new countertop microwave and replace it for 50 bucks. So that's definitely something to consider. They, they're very expensive to purchase and they're really expensive to repair. The yeah, company. very true. Uh, just whenever you're combining things, it's just, yeah, a lot more, a lot trickier to get into. It. And I, I imagine for trying to do your own repairs as well it's just oh, a lot more difficult yeah 100 percent difficulty levels up there on those yeah just going back to what we were talking about with the sparks and things i'm sure you've seen this is a common question for me on, on almost all any appliance what would you do if someone's microwave is reporting is uh tripping their breaker 
uh, mm-hmm. when it when it's on. With the micro, there's actually a little more involved uh, with it tripping the breaker. One of the main reasons that it will trip the breaker, ironically enough, it's the door switches. So every microwave typically has three different door switches. You'll notice when you open the door on a microwave, there's those little latches kind of sticking out of the door. So when that shuts, it activates the three switches. They're kind of like a built-in safety as well. So if one of those switches go bad, as soon as you shut the door, it's going to ground out the electricity and it's going to either trip an internal fuse or it's going to blow the breaker. So usually the first thing you want to look at is uh, to access the door switches and take the wires off and just look at the the terminals that the wires connect to. And a lot of times it's extremely obvious they're bad because they're just burnt up, just almost completely black. The second thing that can cause that is actually the the door itself. So if the door is starting to sag or or it kind of gets misaligned and it's worn out, when you shut the door, the switches need to activate at the same time. And so if you have it to where it kind of closes at a weird angle to where it activates one switch but not two, that could also potentially trip the breaker. So you would be looking at a, a new door in that situation. Then finally, if You shut the door, you open the door, it's fine. The breaker doesn't trip until you actually turn it on. Then you're looking at the high voltage section again with the addition of wanting to replace the transformer. So that repair with the high voltage section alone, you know, you'd be looking at anywhere from, if you're ordering the parts, probably 75 to $200 just in parts. Adding the transformer is gonna add another $100 to that. You know, unless it's built into something, it's usually that means it's time to replace microwave. Yeah, I guess with something smaller like a microwave compared to dishwashers and things, the um, the repair versus just buy a new one ratio goes pretty, pretty far down. And is it in terms of the door and the door switches i am imagining they're at least pretty cheap compared to a newer model the door switches fortunately that component really hasn't changed since microwaves have been around they're generally kind of built the same and you can usually get sellers like on ebay and amazon a lot of times they will put in a kit to where they include all the switches you need if you put in your model number. So that's always really convenient. So whether it's a kit or whether you have to find your switches individually, those parts, I mean, they're four to 12 bucks each. They're they're pretty cheap. A new door kind of varies. Doors are typically very easy to put on. Most microwave doors, like especially the over the range microwaves, when you open it up, there's a tab or there's something, a tab to be removed where once you do that, you could literally just lift the door right off. So as far as easy repairs, that's typically the easiest to do. Mm-hmm. The doors range anywhere from about 70 to about $150. If the doors have the built-in controls like some of them do, those, of course, are more expensive because they're, you know, you shut the door, you got the controls there. So yeah. that could range anywhere from probably 120 to $350 for that. And I guess that the replacement cost will sort of be in respect to the cost of the actual microwave you know mm-hmm. so a cheaper microwave cheaper door etc it's normally um more of a straight or not a straightforward answer but more of a direct repair for something tripping a circuit breaker than the other than right. more major appliances yeah for sure and you know to get to the door switches on most microwaves really aren't that difficult because you don't have to take down the microwave or anything in most cases all you've got to do is remove that vent up top the same one to get to the filter and once you do that you'll see a screw where the uh, user interface is and once that is the screws taken off the user interface lifts up and comes out you can see the door switches right there. It's kind of tricky to get to and to get your hands in, but it's definitely at least worth trying to find a YouTube video on a model similar to yours. And most likely it's it's a repair that that most folks may want to try to do themselves. Yeah, yeah, definitely good to know. Also good good to know, you know, you might not have known to look for the door switch repair Mm -hmm. just through a trip in the breaker, but um, yeah, nice one. Moving on from that would be going back to what you said was typically the most common issue for when uh, the microwave just isn't heating the food you know you're putting it in it's all seems to be working fine the plate spinning lights are on mm-hmm. and the thing comes out cold mm-hmm. so what's the typical uh, causes for that one 90% of the time if everything is 
functioning perfectly normal and it sounds like it's working and like I said everything's spinning and the fans are on 90% of the time it will be your high voltage circuit with the magnetron the capacitor and the diode to the point where most technicians if they get out there and those are the symptoms they observe they don't even take it down to test it they just order those parts without even putting a meter on it I mean that's how common that failure wow. is and so touching on the the safety advice that we gave towards the start that may be more of a new microwave situation unless it's a, a higher end model yeah, yeah, mo most definitely. Uh, yeah, most cases, I mean, yeah, definitely unless it's a really higher end model because most houses I've been to, they have an over the range microwave and brand new over the range microwave for a decent, you know, middle of the road Maytag or whatever you're looking at. You know, we're talking $350. I mean, it's um, pretty worth it to do that. <laughs> Yeah, compared to, I guess, you know, you're probably talking like, what, 150, 200, maybe pushing 300 on a repair if it could be replacing mm -hmm. all three components. And if you have somebody actually look at it, microwave repair labor is uh, always a lot more expensive. You know, I know Sears Home Services, Nationwide Repair Company, their base labor, no matter what it is, is about $220 for a microwave. So if they wow. come over and it's a five minute repair, it's labor of 220 plus, right. so. Yeah, and that could just be replacing the door for the-, <laughs> the Right, yeah. Repair, yeah. But what if the door kind of won't actually open? Have you had that before? I've seen a few people searching it online, just wondering, could that maybe just be stuck food or something like that, or, you know, a grease buildup, or do you think? I think in most cases where the door is an opening, it's the type of door that doesn't have a handle that you just grab and open. It's mm -hmm. the kind that actually have kind of that push uh, deal to open it. And that is a semi-common issue with that type of microwave. That mechanism, it, it's all just plastic. You know, most everything and stuff now is plastic. And so it doesn't take a lot for part of that mechanism to wear out or to break. It's not a very difficult repair. I, I would say the most difficult part of that is to actually get to access it. The units that have that kind of push button to open are typically countertop or built-in microwaves. So you do need to remove the whole case assembly. And when you do that, you'll be able to see that a really simple mechanism. And those parts, I mean, we're talking, you know, maybe $15 online. It's just mainly going to be the hassle of doing it. But if you want to save a couple of bucks, um, that is a, a fairly simple repair once you can access the part. Yeah, I imagine it's just deconstructing and then, go, you know, retracing your steps with the new part. And yeah, as you were saying before, check YouTube for a for a example i'm sure that the the push-in models are all kind of the same yeah 100 percent the same yeah and a good thing too any microwave they actually have uh, what they call safety bits on them so a lot of the screws are going to be your standard phillip head screws they do have a few that are the safety torque bits so essentially it's a kind of screw where it almost looks like an allen wrench would fit but instead of kind of a, a an even octagonal shape i can't remember but it, it's more pointed and in the middle there's like a, a piece of a like circular metal coming out in the middle so you can't put a standard torque screwdriver in there you get you can get a safety bit set at walmart or any hardware store and it's basically kind of hollow in the middle it allows you to remove those screws so if you plan on working it save yourself a trip if you're already at the store and just get a basic safety torque uh, bit set yeah yeah i think um, sometimes when you're working with appliances and things you see you know something that looks totally strange and you think oh they must be a really expensive specialist mm -hmm. tool but actually you can pick it up from from walmart yeah exactly i think another common issue would be or i don't potentially not so common is if the the microwave just stops during cooking you you set everything up set five minutes on it let it start going you come back five minutes later and you know, it's warm slightly, but it's just been stopped after two minutes or something. There's a couple of scenarios that could be a factor in that. So if you set it at two minutes and let's say 30 seconds passes and it's beeping like it's done, 100% it's a control board. And on most models, the control board's one of the easiest parts to change. Once you remove the vent and that one screw that holds the control board, that's it, it lifts off and all you've got to do is disconnect it and reconnect the new one. So, and those aren't generally that expensive. I would say they range anywhere from like 80 to 150 bucks. And the other issue that can cause it to kind of stop in the middle of heating, in these cases, it'll completely shut down. So there is another safety device on the microwave that is essentially, it's almost like a temperature fuse, but it is resettable. And it's mounted on the magnetron, which again is what's responsible for all the energy that's produced to heat the food. Mm -hmm. So once it heats up to the point where it's overheating, 
it'll basically cut off power to the microwave so you don't have any lights you don't have any display but after 20 minutes 30 40 minutes everything will come back on because that fuse is reset you know again unplugged you know safe and everything but that microwave magnetron thermal fuse typically is maybe 15 bucks online and fairly easy to change once you can access the inside it'd be good to try that first and if it's still doing it you're looking at a bad magnetron you know which again you're kind of back in the same spot right yeah so worth the shot on the quick repair and hopefully it works and if not yeah you might be looking at a, a new microwave as opposed to a big repair bill and yeah just to clarify for for anyone not sure uh, about what we mean by control board that's just the buttons the interface that you use to, to input things it's nothing no big like circuit board or something mm -hmm. uh, just because everyone calls these things differently Oh yeah, there's so many names for the same parts, it's, it's yeah. kind of wild. <laughs> well, and so on that control board, if you go to a site where you can see a part breakdown, if you're trying to order it yourself, that control board is typically made up of a couple of different components. The actual buttons that you press, they call that uh, the user interface or the membrane. Beyond that, uh, you have kind of like a metal bracket that the actual control board or the main board or the power board, it's all the same thing, mounts on that bracket. And then sometimes you might even have a separate display board. All of that can be a little annoying to try to change piecemeal. And so most of the time when you look at a parts breakdown, they'll have all those individual parts, but then they'll have the whole thing where it comes pre-assembled. And that's what I recommend. Usually it's only maybe 20 bucks more, but it's totally worth it to not worry about trying to damage it to just change single parts. Yeah, yeah. Better to have the peace of mind and the simplicity rather than fiddle with everything. And so going from it stops too much to it's running mysteriously is um, what if the microwave runs while the door is open? Or, you know, you open the door to stop it and it just keeps going. Yeah, that could be pretty scary for sure. You know, <laughs> you know, this actually is going back to the door switches as well. Whether it runs when you open the door or whether it runs as soon as you shut the door, even when nothing is selected, that is 100% your door switches. You know, a point about the door switches, just like we had talked about the control board trying to get it as a whole assembly, yep. the door switches, all three switches are mounted to kind of a plastic, kind of like a holder assembly for them. The locking tabs that hold the door switches in place are super tiny and especially if your microwave is a few years old they're very brittle and so a lot of times those locking tabs will break if you just try to change the switch so it's definitely recommended that you get the whole assembly with the switches already mounted in place again it's sometimes maybe 20 bucks more but 100 percent worth it just like the parts breakdown for the control board the door switches, you'll see where they have each individual part number, and then they'll kind of have a box around the whole assembly, and they'll have a part number for that. Yeah. Samsung in particular is really good about that part being available. So yeah, 100% get that instead of the individual door switches. I guess the last thing you want is to order them individually, thinking you're saving money, and then realizing that actually it's too difficult. You're going to have to order the fill one anyway. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's very frustrating. When I work on models where it doesn't have a whole assembly, and I can't get just the holder for whatever reason. I look like a surgeon just carefully <laughs> trying to lower the tab and to pull it out, and it's yeah, it's rough. It's good to save a few bucks, but not to, to end up going through hours of stress. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so a common one that I have been seeing from our online readers is if mm -hmm. the microwave just beeps, you're not even touching it, you're just chilling in the kitchen or in, even in another room, and you at every so often will just give out a beep or um, maybe when it's cooking, it seems to be sporadically quite vocal. What, what would you, you look at for diagnosing that? The majority of the times that, that will be that interface membrane issue, it's thinking it's getting some kind of input when it's not. And that's another one of those situations where if you can deal with the annoyance of it, it's not unsafe that that's happening. It's just more of an annoyance. So mm -hmm. because to fix that, you would have to replace, you could go with just a membrane, but again, it'd be easier to get that whole assembly that comes with everything. And I guess similar to, to other appliances that might have similar issues is also, also it could just be like uh, the interface has gotten a bit dirty or there's some gunk on it or something that may mm -hmm. be activating the buttons every now and again and just you know it's a long shot but a good clean of the interface with just some a mild detergent could also fix it yeah and well i'm glad you said that because the other thing is the way that that interface and membrane is connected to the control board is by what they call a ribbon cable which is a connector that's about as thick as a piece of paper and it plugs into the control board and there is a plastic lock 
So if you were to unlock it where it connects to the control board, that ribbon cable just gently pulls right out and you could actually take some rubbing alcohol and just gently clean both sides of that ribbon uh, connection mm -hmm. and put it back in. And more often than not, that actually does fix uh, an issue like that. Wow, great. So yeah, definitely worth trying for, a, mm -hmm. for all sorts of uh, interface issues, I guess. Yeah, and, and that works for any type of appliance. Um, if you were to just get on YouTube and just search you know, uh, cleaning a ribbon cable connection or something, uh, you'll see a bunch of things come up, you know, anything from a Q-tip and alcohol to, I had an old school technician, he always used a pencil eraser, which works too, okay. you know, to kind of clean that stuff off, like any buildup or anything. So yeah, there, there's a lot of different things you could do. <laughs> nice one, I, I can imagine the sort of, the old timer pulling the pencil from behind his ear and just brushing oh, yeah. it off and there, there you go. And potentially, uh, again, uh, another interface problem is um, if the microwave just decides to turn on and start cooking, this could be the homeowners accidentally left a few, you know, some time on the, you know, they've stopped it early. There's still mm -hmm. some time left over or just completely sporadically. Could yeah. that just be buttons again, do you think? Yeah, the, the button and control board assembly. Yeah, it could definitely be either or. And especially if you have, it's like an actual electronic display that has a timer and a countdown. 100% it'll be the control board uh, interface issue. So you're looking at um, wiping down the, the board, maybe with a mild detergent. Uh, opening it up and checking the cable that connects the you know the super thin cable that connects your board to the circuit board and potentially replacing the uh, the interface unit as a whole. Yeah, because that ribbon cable it it's almost like if you've ever looked really close at an electronic board how there's kind of like really flat soldered connections on there that's almost like what that ribbon cable looks like it's essentially like a track like a solder connection on a board and so especially if your microwave's a few years old a lot of times that track can just literally just kind of rub off and just disintegrate over time so you may see that ribbon cable and go to clean it and it looks like you've just cleaned off the metal part which you have and it was just deteriorated anyway and there's you know confirmation that you're going to need a new uh, control interface so Right. Yeah. Uh, definitely good to know. Okay. Going back to a, a normally working microwave in terms of, you know, the, the door closes, the buttons work and everything like that. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, quite a common one. I've had it a few times myself is that the dish or the plate won't actually spin. Now, hopefully the best case scenario is it's not spinning because you've accidentally turned it, the feature off. So a lot of microwaves do have an option to turn it on or off. But if you verified that it is turned on and it's not spinning, so I actually, I'll say that this is probably the second easiest to repair on a microwave. 99 out of 100 times, it's gonna be what they call the turntable motor. Most microwaves, especially the over the range ones, where the filters are underneath and where the light is and everything around the perimeter of the outside underneath the microwave there's about three or four screws on the side about three or four screws up top or in the front on the bottom once those are removed that whole bottom panel kind of swings down right there is your turntable motor it's one connection it's only one or two screws and that thing comes out you know we're talking 15 to 30 dollars online so that you know make sure to unplug it but that's definitely a real easy repair that even if someone isn't too familiar with fixing stuff and all that you know we're talking maybe a 30 minute job it's always good to, to be able to have the confidence that it, it is a cheaper repair and then mm -hmm. um, just to throw in a sort of a little a little hack or something from my own past was just that the, your your dish may actually just be off of the sort of ridges that it connects to and so yes. they're spinning and grinding but the the actual plate's not moving and hopefully that you know that could be the cause just make sure that's in there if you turn it yourself i guess yeah, yeah. definitely and and to to take the tray out and a little spinny deal on the outside and just clean it up because there may be some debris or something preventing it from spinning as well so yeah yeah fingers crossed that's it and you don't have to take it apart but if you do exactly, yeah, yeah the repair is not too not too bad what if the microwave is just super loud maybe the fan is sounding ridiculous or just all sorts of you know different noises and things is that yeah. a common report when we talk about a fan with a microwave and you know most of of these scenarios i'm given are the over the range microwave because especially in american households that's really the most common kind of setup you have a vent fan that you know again is venting from underneath out through the front 
and then you have a cooling fan in, inside. So every time you turn your microwave on, that fan you hear is the cooling fan. There's usually not a lot of trouble with that. I mean, in, in 16 years, I think I've only had to replace maybe two cooling fans. Typically what noise you're gonna hear is a really loud buzz, almost like a high voltage electric kind of buzzing, loud, vibrating, shaking. That is usually due to a diode and the transformer being bad. You know, again, that's kind of one of those repairs where it's pretty expensive if somebody comes out. It's dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. And so if you're hearing that, and especially if it's also not heating, if that's associated with about the time you heard the sound, it's, you know, start looking for a new microwave, basically. Yeah, if that's for if it is a super loud buzzing sound, but essentially just to wrap up on that. Expensive repair, sorry, expensive to hire someone to repair, mm -hmm. dangerous to repair, but mm -hmm. uh, would you say that it's dangerous to the homeowner to continue using it if they don't mind the sound? I would probably recommend against using it because um, that transformer, it's kind of in line with the magnetron. The magnetron, I mean, I, I want to say it puts out, I, I wish I would have looked this up prior, but it's something like 100,000 volts of electricity or something. It's it's a lot. Yeah. So yeah, anytime you have something malfunctioning in that part of it, definitely best to just not use it. Yeah, it makes sense. Good, good to be able to identify that compared to other issues which sound dangerous but are fine to, to operate with. Yeah, yeah. And nice and simple one just to want to touch on it, but if the door won't latch, um, and I guess mm. there's a few different uh, types of doors, but I, I, I guess we're always taking the case off and looking at the latching mechanism, potentially replacing it, hopefully clearing out something that could be blocking it. A lot of times when it doesn't latch, the point sticking out on the door is basically like the strike and where it goes inside the microwave and activates the switches, you know, that, that's almost like the catch. It's typically an issue with the part on the door. Most of the time, you'll notice that if you hold the door and you're, you're looking at the kind of latches sticking out, you can kind of move it and you feel there's resistance. Inside the microwave, that latch assembly is connected by a little tiny spring connected to a little tiny hook inside the microwave and it's, it's plastic where it connects. And so a lot of times that'll break and you don't have that resistance. In theory, it's an easy repair because you access that pretty much the same way on any microwave by kind of removing this plastic piece and popping this stuff out. But even for an experienced technician, there's only about a 50-50 chance we'll be able to disassemble the door, change the part, and reassemble without breaking anything. Yeah, especially if it's a few years old, again, it's, it's going to be brittle, it's plastic. So if that's the case, you can try, it's like a $10 part for the latch and spring. So if you want to try that first, maybe worth it rather than, you know, a $150 door. But yeah, that, that's what you'd be looking at if it's not shutting or staying shut. Okay, yeah, so the, the sort of fallback option would just be the, the new door. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, there's also some variants. There's some microwaves that have kind of a, a moving mechanism associated with the door switch inside. What you may want to do is try to look up some information on your particular model first, because on those it is pretty common for that moving mechanism inside to get stuck in the wrong position. But that's kind of a model specific basis and, and most microwaves don't have that particular assembly in it, so. Yeah, it makes sense. And just for anyone, you know, you can always find your, your model information. I think it's almost always either behind, you know, on the, the rear of the door or just inside the case. Or yeah, just, yeah, uh, just inside the little sticker, yeah. Yeah, quick Google of that and the door replacement will hopefully uh, answer your question about whether, you know, it could be one of those issues. What if you are having the extremely frustrating issue of your microwave always burning your popcorn and you can no longer enjoy a good movie? Uh, yes. Would you, you look into for that one? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that could definitely ruin a good movie, especially if that's your last bag of popcorn. You know, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of microwaves will have a popcorn button, which... You know, it's great. You think, hey, I'll just push the popcorn button and don't have to worry about it. The way that a microwave can actually cook food like that is it has a moisture sensor. And so as it, the heat's coming up and the moisture inside the food and everything is, you know, coming out and heating up, it will basically say, okay, this is the range that it needs to be for popcorn and this is when it's done but because of changes and the popcorn and the and the butter and just everything that makes up it usually doesn't cook right i don't know if it's either in the it might even be on the popcorn where it says you know don't use the popcorn button on your microwave i, I think i've seen that before so yeah that's going to be the main reason so yeah you definitely want to just put it in there high heat you know about two or three minutes and listen to the uh few seconds between pops before you pull it out but yeah don't use the microwave popcorn button 
Yeah, I've got that experience myself. For me, it's oh. about about a minute and a half, and that's it. Don't touch the popcorn setting. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, but, yeah. I didn't realize on the uh, food packaging though. It's hilarious. Yeah, I, I've seen it before, I, and I don't know if they've done it. Maybe they've changed, and so you know. But yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting. I had mentioned earlier, I had worked on microwaves for years until one day I said, you know, how does this even cook the food? I, I had no idea. So I went online and started looking, and it's actually really fascinating. So the technology for a microwave was basically invented about the time that they were creating radar. And mm -hmm. so that's one of the reasons they were called a radar range back in the day when they were first coming out. But essentially what happens when that magnetron is energized and it creates a field, the waves of energy coming into the microwave basically create a positive and a negative charge, you know, almost like a wave as they're moving. So the water molecules inside the food that you put in there are attracted and then repelled depending on the charge of the wave that's passing through. So your food getting hot is actually caused by the friction of the water molecules inside the food moving, you know, which is fascinating. So anyone who's like, oh, I don't want to microwave food because I don't want that radiation or anything <laughs> like that. It's actually the food inside that's just, you know, friction, just like rubbing your hands together. It, yeah, so, so it's really fascinating. Uh, it's sort of one microscopic dance party going on in there. Oh, yeah, yeah, or like a mosh pit, you know, just everything. <laughs> Pretty much together. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So one thing that I hear a lot is, you know, why sometimes when I heat up my coffee that the handle on the coffee cup is super hot and I can mm. barely touch it. So depending on what the makeup is of the dishes you're putting in there, if there's more molecules that could move inside that, they're going to get hotter. So it's not your microwave cooking something wrong. You just may want to find a different coffee cup, one that the handle isn't going to get as hot. But but that's why, because it's just more susceptible to that kind of volatile, positive and negative movement inside. Yeah, it's 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 essentially why you know some materials are microwave safe is just that the molecules won't be dancing back and forth. Right, um, right. And it's also why it's uh, extremely dangerous for humans because we are all watery and fleshy and stuff. So, you know, you would That's, not want that to, is for sure. not be fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's good to keep in mind whenever you are putting a, a dish in there and it's got lots of different things of different densities. You know, maybe you've got some, your meat with your potato, potatoes and things and they're all going to react differently. So that's why mm -hmm. it's sometimes, yeah, you'll have different hot parts or cold parts of your dish. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just worth bearing in mind. So if you've got a microwave and the light is just stuck on, you can't seem to get it off. You know, it's still on when the door's closed. What would you, you look at for that? You know, most of the time, it, a lot of the issues really do come back to the door switches because they, they provide kind of so many different functions on whether the door's opened or closed. And so 99 out of 100 times when you shut the door, if the light stays on, um, it is because of one of those door switches. And usually if that is the symptom, then you're not able to start it. So you can press buttons, it'll beep, but nothing happens when you hit the start button because it thinks that the door's still open. Okay, so then we're going back into um, trying to maybe uh, take the door off to replace it or change the, the switches inside? Yeah, yeah, definitely. The point sticking out on the door is basically like the strike and where it goes inside the microwave and activates the switches you know, that, that's almost like the catch. It's typically an issue with the part on the door. Most of the time, you'll notice that if you hold the door and you're, you're looking at the kind of latches sticking out, you can kind of move it and you feel there's resistance. Inside the microwave, that latch assembly is connected by a little tiny spring connected to a little tiny hook inside the microwave and it's, it's plastic where it connects. And so a lot of times that'll break and you don't have that resistance. In theory, it's an easy repair because you access that pretty much the same way on any microwave by kind of removing this plastic piece and popping this stuff out. But even for an experienced technician, there's only about a 50-50 chance we'll be able to disassemble the door, change the part, and reassemble without breaking anything. Yeah, especially if it's a few years old, again, it's, it's going to be brittle, it's plastic. So if that's the case, you can try, it's like a $10 part for the latch and spring. So if you want to try that first, maybe worth it rather than, you know, $150 door. But yeah, that, that's what you'd be looking at if it's not shut or staying shut. Okay, yeah, so the, the sort of fallback option would just be the, the new door. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. speaking of the light too, the uh, underneath light, what's it called? Surface light or whatever that you turn on when you're cooking. So mm -hmm. you can see underneath the microwave for the over the range microwaves. Now, if that light stays on, it's only supposed to come on whenever you hit the button to turn it on. So if it's not turning off, 
then it's actually a control board issue. Uh, there's basically like a relay that turns that light on and off and so if it's stuck on you would have to replace the control board. Now if you don't really use that light a lot the cheaper solution may just be to just take the light bulb out which wouldn't hurt anything so. Yeah, I mean, I guess that would fix it. <laughs> so if you're if the actual light in the microwave itself is stuck on, probably a door issue, maybe change the, the door latches and things. Mm -hmm. And if it's the light below, um, if you've got an over the range, then that's a circuit board, which is probably um, a bit too intense of a repair just for that light. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be a very expensive light repair. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, they, they yeah. even make those magnetic lights. You could just stick underneath and turn it on. You know, it's only 20 <laughs> bucks, thinking, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there you go, problem solved. Yeah, exactly. And then what if the the light is off altogether? It could just be a blown bulb or, or anything like that. Are they difficult to replace microwave bulbs? Yeah, so it's it's hit or miss. The underneath lights for the over the range are, are always uh, fairly simple. Most of them use kind of a specific light bulb. So you want to look at the owner's manual because they will have a part number and rating for the light bulb you need, especially if it's like a LED light that you've got to pop in and out. As far as the interior light, there are some out there where you can change the interior light by just opening the door and reaching inside and, and there's some type of cover. But a lot of them, you've actually got to take the outside cover of the microwave off. And so if it's an over the range microwave, it's, it's a pretty hefty job because you've got to pull it down and take it all apart. If you get to that point, most of the time it's really not that bad. The inside light typically wouldn't, the part number wouldn't be in the owner's manual. You would have to go to a website to look up the part number and order that specifically. Now, one thing to kind of look out for Certain microwaves to change the interior light is, is an absolute nightmare. Um, a general rule of thumb, the more fancy and expensive it is, the harder it is to change the interior light. I had a job where it was one of these real fancy ones where the door opened instead of opening like, you know, kind of left and right opening, it was like an up and down opening. It took me and one other technician nearly four hours to change the light bulb. And by the time we got to the light bulb, we had probably 50 screws off, two or three different wiring harness almost completely disassembled and moved aside, wow. about six different panels that we had to remove to get to the light bulb. <laughs> and it was, it was absolutely insane. Like the engineers, it, it, like they did it on purpose because they hate technicians. I'm, I'm not sure why they did <laughs> yeah, it that way. But, yeah. It was, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I like <laughs> every 10 minutes, I'm like, I can't believe they designed it this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that's uh, crazy. Yeah, for a little $2 LED light bulb, you know, you're talking 400 plus dollars in labor. <laughs> Man, it's the most yeah. expensive light bulb repair ever. Oh, God, something. yeah. So at that point, I mean, I guess it maybe just cooked the food in the dark. <laughs> yeah, I mean, pretty much. That's, uh, because, man, that, yeah. And, you know, if you do want to try the repair, a lot of times you, you don't know until you get into it. So kind of a rule of thumb, if you're going to change the interior light bulb, take the unit down, take the outside panel off, and look and see if you could see where that light bulb is connected on the, on the underside, you know, where you see the terminals going to it. And if you mm -hmm. can't see it, I'd probably leave it alone <laughs> if it's yeah. not right there. So it's going to be buried deep in there somewhere. Oh my goodness, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. And yeah, I guess just as a as a note for anyone who has a, a dark microwave <laughs> that you don't actually need the light, it's not gonna do anything. You, It's only just for you to, to check the progress, which even then is quite difficult because you, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to tell. It's not like, you know, looking in the oven when you can see if things are browned or not. So yeah, not the, not the biggest thing to live without, especially if it's uh, one of these repairs. Oh yeah. And you know, you mentioned um, not really being able to see in there anyway, because they've got that kind of pattern on the on the you know glass or the screen or whatever. So what's what's interesting about that is that's pretty much just a sticker, and that's what prevents the microwave you know rays essentially from leaving the microwave. Which kind of brings up a point: if you notice that film is damaged or coming off, it's not safe to use. You know, when you want to see in the microwave, you kind of got to do this number, move your head really fast so you can see inside. But <laughs> that's what that does. That that's why that's there. Okay, so any sort of scratching or damage on the coating either side of the door, or is it, I think it's typically on the inside? Yeah, um, yeah, typically on the inside, and, and a lot of times you could feel it's kind of raised, um, right, but yeah, that, yeah, that's definitely a safety thing. Something to watch out for. Is there any kind of symptoms you think that would that you'd be experiencing that, you know, other than seeing it? I'm just trying to think if 
you know, yeah. would you sort of feel warm <laughs> when you walk past it or something? You know, I'm not too sure. I, I've always wondered that. If there is a leakage, do you notice something or is it so fast that, you know, you wake up in the ER? I'm, I'm really not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ho hopefully not the latter, but right, uh, right. Good, good to know for sure. One other thing that I think it's, I, I don't know if this is like a common issue or if it's just something people um, tend to notice, but sometimes they'll be cooking food and the microwave just seems super wet inside after mm -hmm. cooking. Is that just a sort of side effect of all the moisture that's, you know, building up or can it be a sign of anything going wrong? It generally, it, it's just going to be what you're cooking, you know, how, how much moisture is in there. There could be possible buildup of grease inside or, or a slight kind of ventilation issue inside. But generally, it, it's just going to be because of what you're cooking and uh, it, it's no cause for uh, concern there so yeah good to know good to be safe just because people are searching it and they're just sort of curious so good to cover that i think that's about all the troubleshooting notes that i have here unless you can think of any others we had touched on it, it is semi-common especially for a microwave that's you know a few years old that they do start to take longer to heat things and that's normal it's not something that you know to have a technician out and pay a couple of hundred dollars because that can go on for you know years and years and and never stop heating because that's just the the magnetron the heating unit just kind of getting worn out but it's not a safety issue and um really if you've just got to cook it for an extra 20 seconds it's not really a big deal so yeah just worth bearing in mind i guess there is an, an eventual lifespan expe expectancy with these things but yeah how long in general would you expect to sort of start considering a new microwave versus repairing one um, if it's over say i don't know 10 years old something like that 10 years is a pretty good mark microwaves are one of those appliances that fortunately they're in general they're still built like how they were built you know years and years ago the the magnetron's essentially the same the capacitor the diode the switches which really works in its favor because in general, just about everything used to last a lot longer. You know, refrigerators, you could have them out in a garage and they last 30 years and, you know, appliances would last 20 years. So yeah, generally microwaves have a pretty long lifespan, but yeah, I would say 10 years is a pretty good, pretty good mark. Yeah, just to start being aware. Yeah, I guess it just comes down to what symptoms you're experiencing, if any. Yeah, and uh, yeah, most microwaves, the sticker inside that has a model number also has a production date. They're one of the few appliances where you can actually look at the sticker and know when it was uh, made. And so if you're curious, you, you can find that information there too. Yeah, yeah, always good to know. Well, shall we dive into the, the brand comparisons? Just throwing a few uh, different recommendations out there and things. Uh, yeah, yeah, I definitely want to talk about uh, convection as well too. So we'll have to mm -hmm. remember to talk about that. But, uh, but yeah, definitely brands. Yeah. Got it noted down for sure. So is there any, is it better to do this in terms of different, you know, uh, over the range versus countertop versus um, what's the other one? Sorry, wall wall uh, microwaves. Should we just do a general one or go into individuals? Generally, even with the different kinds of microwaves, the brand recommendation would be the same. You know, so if one brand does good with this microwave, they generally do good with all the other type of microwaves. Mm -hmm. So that does make it a little easier. What's really interesting about microwaves is it'll have the brand on the outside but inside the parts may be made by a, a, a totally different company like samsung really makes a lot of parts for a lot of different microwaves um, so it may be like a sharp on the outside but it'll have a samsung magnetron most of the time when you're comparing brands it's going to be more so the the features that are available in, in the design i have a tendency to be pretty critical of ge uh on a lot of their appliances um, but like even a GE microwave would have no problem with. There's really not a whole lot of them I, I wouldn't recommend as far as quality and longevity. There are some that if you do want to have your microwave worked on, it's harder to find people to work on them. And it's also harder to find parts and support online. Like Magic Chef is kind of an example of that. They're good microwaves, but it, it's really hard to get parts for them. And I've had cases in the past where even if it was a warranty type call, we actually had to go out and diagnose, contact 
the magic chef parts distributor you have them order the part and then come back so it's kind of a process with them yeah mm-hmm. i guess so. as opposed to something like a samsung where they're just everywhere yeah yeah where we just go out it's it's super easy to find parts as far as brands samsung i kind of hate on them a little bit for just having way too many bells and whistles that people don't need but yes. generally all of the features they have on their microwaves are, are pretty cool you know a lot of their microwaves have the controls on the door itself so it just is a lot more of a sleek design and they, they just have kind of a lot of cool uh, features when you look at your you know more domestic type brands uh, kenmore whirlpool maytag those are generally a little more simple in design unless you get like a kenmore elite or one of the more designer lines of that model and so those are good real simple let's see i'm trying to think of what other lg makes a good microwave yeah that's uh, fortunately about microwaves you, you you don't really have to be too picky that is one where you can literally just choose the one that you like the way it looks the best and be pretty confident you're still getting a good product yeah that, that's it's really good to know especially compared to other things where you know like TVs or something where it does start to really matter. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And speaking of features in terms of buying decisions and things, is there any that you'd recommend or that you've seen give people hassle and so maybe wouldn't recommend? Any type of microwave, and I know that some drawer type microwaves have this feature where there's a separate function to open the door, like essentially where there's like an open door button, because instead of just the, the good old fashioned grab it with your hand and open the door, you're mm-hmm. introducing another mechanism that could eventually fail. So it's kind of nice and it looks kind of fancy, but that is something to keep in mind that that could definitely fail and you'll have to get a repair when you could have just got a microwave that you just open with your hand. So. <laughs> Yeah, true. I imagine for you know the the people that uh, spend thousand plus dollars on a, a drawer microwave that if you wave at it, it'll open the drawer for you right. and stuff. It's it's great until it doesn't work anymore, and then all mm-hmm. of a sudden, yeah, it's a it's a expensive repair. Well, that's the thing with a lot of repairs, and, and not just microwaves, but really anything in general is just the more advanced it gets, the more potential of failures that you have, and they mm-hmm. they get kind of too smart for their own good. The example that's always going to stay with me is back when TVs were a lot more expensive, and you know, technician, it was worth it to have it repaired instead of replaced. Mm-hmm. There was a big expensive i can't remember what brand it was but it was a plasma it weighed a thousand pounds and it wasn't turning on and i had access to the service manual and it had a blink error code which was normal but i couldn't find that error code anywhere in the service manual i ended up having to call the manufacturer's tech assist and i'm like hey what is this error code i can't find it anywhere and so after a moment they got back with me and said Oh, that that error code that's preventing the TV from even turning on is a loose speaker connection. (laughs) And so sure enough, one of the four speakers that were in there, I saw it was just barely disconnected and I just connected it and the TV came on. That was an issue where nobody would have noticed. You you wouldn't notice really any difference in sound quality, but it totally prevent you from using it because of it's like, hey, we're not going to turn on because of this. So wow, that's crazy. It just shuts down the whole thing. And when in reality, probably they have like a sound bar anyway. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah. Another external speaker. Oh, yeah. 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 (laughs) That's so it's maybe we could chat about uh, drawer microwaves a little bit. Um, we've done a series of articles on them and I do find them fascinating in terms Mm -hmm. of, um, yeah, just how much tech is packed in there. And uh, like, it's really great, the different design. And I think especially for, for maybe someone who isn't, you know, uh, maybe doesn't have the back to lift up to an over the range, uh, Mm -hmm. microwave and stuff is great to pick it up. Um, but yeah, do you tend to see many issues with drawers? And I think I know as well that some of them, they don't actually spin the, the plate. I think the. It's actually the, the element that, or the cooking element, spins in the uh, ceiling of the microwave itself. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, drawer microwaves are really neat. They're very, um, yeah, I mean, they, they are. They're, they're just neat. And then, the, you know, as far as accessing them and, and using them, like you said, you know, is, is a lot easier to get to. So the, the cooking portion of it, it's actually really interesting. So a lot of microwaves have this anyway, even if they have a turntable, but it's called a, a stir motor. And so essentially it it almost looks like a fan blade. And so Mm -hmm. as that microwave is kind of guided through its path into the cavity, this stir motor with this blade turns on and basically breaks up the microwave so it it distributes more evenly. Yeah, and that's that's how that's able to work. I don't see a lot in the field just because most people don't have them, I think because of the price point for the most Mm -hmm. part. The ones that I have seen in the field in general they they are very good quality. I mean, they're they're definitely built to last, 
And so I would put those over other microwaves as far as not having really any trouble with it. But I would also put them in the category of if something does happen, it may be hard to find someone who will work on it or who can work on it successfully. Yeah, makes sense. I, I guess um, if people aren't, or if technicians aren't too familiar with something, especially something as rare as a drawer microwave, it yeah, mm. could get tricky to, to get that repaired. And also very expensive to replace. Oh, yeah. I believe that Sharp were the ones that came out with the originals, and then essentially most of the drawer microwave models are like using Sharp components, or their design at least, um, huh. with, with like a rebrand on top, especially like the Bosch one and Gen Air and stuff, I think, are, are sort of sharp internals. That wouldn't surprise me. I, you know, and that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, too, of one brand having their parts inside of, you know, a lot of different other brands. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, that, that wouldn't surprise me. I know I've seen quite a few sharp uh, magnetrons in, in random microwaves. So, yeah, I guess you just don't know what you're going to get when you open the box sometimes. Mm -hmm. And shall we touch on convection microwaves then? Because um, yeah. I guess they they have their own range of um, not complications, but you are putting two two different types of cooking into one appliance. Is there any kind of common issues that you would see there, or any kind of uh, recommendations you'd have for someone looking at or an owner of a convection microwave? The biggest complaint that that I, I see in the field with convection microwaves isn't so much that they break, because a, a con the convection part of the microwave is essentially like a, a an air fryer essentially because you have an, a heating element and a fan and kind of a small space you know it does get really hot you know upwards of 350 you can set the temperature at but the the biggest complaint i get is is the smell because you know you're, you're cooking in there there's a lot more happening and a lot of those smells can linger a lot longer so you know just what we touched on earlier about different ways to deodorize and clean your microwave if you use a convection feature a lot you, you really want to stay vigilant with that because if you cook enough in there, it's going to be really hard to get that the, the smell of whatever you're cooking in there out if, if you don't uh, stay on that pretty pretty good. Yeah, and I can imagine it, it must be the equivalent of um, trying to clean a really old greasy oven, except the oven's really small, so it's such an awkward you know angle to try and get in there and everything. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, just um, was it the putting you know a small glass of vinegar and stuff, sort of similar to the dishwashers and that? Would you recommend that kind of thing to break up any buildup? How would you sort of recommend to keep up with the, the microwaves again? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, just putting a, a, a bowl of, you know, water and, and vinegar and, and heating it, letting it boil, getting a lot of that moisture inside, you know, and they, they make different types of uh, things you can buy that you actually fill up with stuff. And so as it gets hot, it, it shoots steam out. And so, yeah, they, there's a lot of different things out there uh, for cleaning the microwave. So really good to know. So uh, another thing with the convection is you definitely want to read your owner's manual on the convection cooking uh, before you start messing with it because just like the ovens they have kind of an automatic like convection convert temperature ability essentially so if the recipe calls to cook at 350 in a regular oven it's going to be different in convection cooking and so you want to see if your microwave does that automatically or if you have to put in the convection temperature not the traditional cooking temperature the other thing that you want to find out too is uh, some microwaves do have the option to cook as a combination with the microwave and the convection at the same time. You want to find out if your microwave does that automatically because that'll limit what you can put in there to cook. You know, depending on what type of cookware you're using, if you're doing just solely convection, you have more options than if it's going to activate the microwave portion at the same time. So just for safety and for best results in cooking, uh, definitely take the time and, and read the section on convection before you use it. Yeah, uh, definitely. And I wish there was some sort of simple uh, rules of thumb we could give, but it, it, I guess it does vary entirely by, by model. And um, yeah, just read those user manuals. Um, yeah. And we, if you don't have your user manual, if you're like me, I often throw them out pretty much the day that I, I open something. You can often just look it up online, get the, the model number from within the door or just inside the, the microwave and it should pop right up. We also have a, a guide on the website just to help you find any product manual pretty much for anything. So yeah, we're, we're here if you need us. Yeah, um, definitely. I don't know if there's any specifics in terms of comparing over the range, say, versus a wall or a countertop other than just, I don't know, ease of access or 
placement, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. The, exactly those. The size, you know, the, the cavity mm -hmm. size uh, would, would be typically your over the range microwaves are a little bit bigger. Power rating, you know, there's typically, I, I believe it's either like an 1100 or a 1500 watt, kind of those are generally the two different ones. Yeah. Um, and, and those also vary, you know, either or for a countertop built in over the range. One really neat thing that I do like are, are what they call the space saver microwaves, which is essentially, um, they're usually over the range microwaves, but they're about half the height. So it's, you know, for a lot of people, if they don't plan on putting a whole big, huge casserole dish in there to cook it, and they're just heating up pizza and just leftovers and things like that, um, those are great. They're really not that much more expensive. They're really sleek in design. And a lot of older houses, when they were built, they weren't built to have an over the range microwave over the oven. And mm -hmm. so I've seen some cases where they put one there and there's not a lot of space between the cooking surface of the oven and the microwave, especially with gas ovens and things like that. So, you know, if you're worried about it being too close and, and burning and potential fires and things, those low profile microwaves are a really good option for that too. Yeah, definitely good to know. And uh, especially with an older home, I can imagine that gets, uh, yeah, your your working room isn't too high. No, uh, yeah, too I, I've, I've seen some questionable uh, installs on some of them. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pretty much just, you want to buy this? Okay, we'll sell it to you, no problem. We'll install it. It doesn't matter that it's going to, you know, completely limit your, your counter space. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. This is kind of a random thing, but if for whatever reason you have to take your over the range microwave off, maybe you're having some cabinet work done or something. And so you just set it on the counter to use it. That's fine. But I would highly recommend taking the underneath light bulbs out first. I had a call where that's what the customer did. They were having something done. So they had it on the counter. They had had it on the counter for weeks. And when I went to move it, it had burnt a hole in the countertop because yeah. someone accidentally turned the light on, but because it was right against the cabinet, nobody knew, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, so so that's just a weird random thing to be aware of. If, if you've got yours on the counter, check that. Yeah, oh my God, it must have just been sitting, burning itself for days. Oh yeah, just or on, yeah, for days and days. The other thing too with mm -hmm. convection, it is really convenient to have your microwave and you know your convection slash air fryer all in the same unit. It really does make the price jump up. You know, I, I would say kind of a baseline in general, expect to pay twice as much for an oven with a, or a microwave with a convection feature. Something else you may want to consider too, uh, is just to have a regular microwave and then to have, you know, a separate convection, whether it's like an air fryer or something like that. Cause I know a lot of times there's a lot more features and, and options and styles. If you just go for a totally separate, convection type air fryer and sometimes you could save a lot of money too so that's something to, to consider and look at your options yeah definitely worth considering and uh, as you were saying earlier it's you know you're not going to have a problem getting someone repairing a normal microwave but when you have a convection one might start to get tricky uh, oh yeah or easier and cheaper to replace one at a time as well if something goes wrong mm -hmm. and uh one question for myself and i'm sure some other people are, are curious on this as well um, when it comes to watts, the watt rating of a microwave, you're pretty much just, that's the amount of uh, microwaves or the, the strength of them that's going to be heating the food, therefore reducing the amount of cooking time, right? In terms of recommendations, because I know that, you know, with these things, people, you know, if there's a number, they want the biggest number type of thing. Mm -hmm. But is there ever any issues with having too many watts or anything like that? Or is it just a case of any number is good? About the only difference between a lower and a higher watt microwave is, uh, I, I forget what the average number of, or the average amount of time to boil like an eight ounce glass of water is. I wish I could remember. L let's just say that a, a higher watt microwave could do it in a minute and a half. A lower watt microwave may take two minutes. And so really the difference in wattage, it's, it's really not that noticeable. You know, a lot of times with frozen foods or hot pockets or whatever, it'll have the two different directions of time for the lower and the higher watt microwaves. And I, I want to say a lot of times it's maybe like a 30 or 45 second difference. So yeah, I definitely yeah. wouldn't pay that much more for the, for the higher wattage if, if you're looking at a lower wattage. Yeah. It's not like a car where you're getting, you know, a bigger engine or something's going to make, you know, a big difference. Yeah. Only a time difference. It's, it's not a big deal. It's also uh, not going to make too much of a difference to your electricity cost as well obviously it's, you know a microwave will never run up a big electricity bill but we were running the numbers for some kettles and stuff recently and it mm -hmm. it's interesting to see that you know because you might be using more power but you take less time it actually works out pretty much bang on equal oh um, yeah so yeah nothing to to really worry about there 
Yeah, yeah. And it, it's like well, when we were talking about dishwashers, how it's energy efficient, this and that and everything, but it takes three times as long as an old dishwasher. <laughs> you know, it's ironically still energy and water efficient because it just uses less everything, so. Yeah, yeah, just at the end of the day, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think that pretty much wraps us up. Anything else you'd like to, to touch on? Oh, oh, another good habit with a microwave is I know a lot of times we're heating something up. So you do like a quick start or you just put in a random number and hit the start button. And when you go to check on it or to stir it, you'll just open the door and do that and close it and start it again. So opening the door without pausing at first will actually reduce the life of the door switches. So what happens is as that energy is flowing through your microwave, through the door switches, through the high voltage circuit and the magnetron and everything's working, when you just open the door, the point at which that electricity is suddenly cut off is at the door switches. And so it's a lot of wear and tear. It's, it can cause them to prematurely go out. By actually pausing the microwave, that action of cutting off the power is done in the relay on the control board, which is equipped to handle that that on and off. So yeah, definitely do that. I've even had cases where people will you know open it when it's cooking and it'll trip the breaker and stuff like that. And th those are all reasons why, so. Wow, yeah, I never knew that. That's a really good tip and it makes complete sense, yeah. We'll definitely put that in our guides in, uh, in terms of our best practices and stuff. It's yeah. one of those things you don't think about, you know, I open the door, the power goes off, so no problem. Right. right? It's something I try to do, but I'm still bad about it, especially if it's <laughs> yeah. midnight and I'm heating up a burrito. You know, I'm not thinking about <laughs> pausing it, but yeah, it's definitely best practice. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, it makes sense, makes sense. I think that about wraps us up for today. Thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions, just leave them in the comments. We'll be more than happy to answer them. And uh, yeah, yeah, take care. Have a good day. All right. Thanks, everybody.